We're at Mobile World Congress 2019 in Barcelona, and I'm joined by Eleanor Fersman. Eleanor, how are you? Very good, thank you. Thank, great to see you. Thanks for uh, joining me on camera. Now, you are the Head of AI Research at Ericsson, an exciting role. Um, could we maybe just kick off with a, a bit of a summary of what that role entails and uh, what the AI research part of Ericsson does? Uh, yes, uh, so I have a team of uh, about 100 researchers. Uh, we are in uh, eight or nine different research teams across the globe in many different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we are doing technology innovation really and proof of concepts that uh, help Ericsson to move forward with innovations. Okay. And we are not really building products, we are building research. Right. New algorithms, uh, new in inventions, new patents, new papers. How long has this group been in place? Uh, is it a newly formed uh, thing, or is I mean, Ericsson's been doing a lot of research and development over the years. I mean, they've invented programming languages like Erlang. They've created uh, you know hardware and software technologies and patents like crazy. How long has this particular part of the organisation been together? When did it form, and how long has it been running for? We've been around for more than ten years. Wow. Uh, and we've been doing. Uh, we started doing data analytics. Right. Uh, and then it was a lot of different data. We used data from telecom networks, we used data from IoT networks, we used data from robotics, for example. Okay. And uh, then we gradually shifted to do more and more machine learning. And uh, now we are moving into other AI technologies such as genetic algorithms and machine reasoning. Wow. Well, we hear a lot about uh, the shift to the whole end-to-end -end story that Ericsson's taking now that, you know, I, mean, I think there was a very broad uh, portfolio capability anyway for decades and decades, but now it's all about from the very moment you get an idea about a product or a service or capability, whether it's consumer or prosumer or industry groups, um, transport, logistics, aviation, you name it, mining, all the way through to the end story to potentially a self-service capability at the consumer end, uh, centrally hosted as well as distributed. Um, Maybe give us some insight into kind of some of the areas you're working on currently and where you're able to transform what's been done in the last sort of 20, 30, 40 years in the organization through manual processes and where you've been able to automate those and apply analytics and, and mm -hmm. machine learning to some of those sorts of things to get better insights and better outcomes. Yes, sure. We have the whole scale, actually. Okay. So we're working with a 5G system, of course. Yes. Uh, and uh, what comes after 5G, the 5G evolution, uh, kind of... Uh, working with the parameters of the 5G system so that it mm -hmm. becomes better. The features, the new features, they become better through machine right. learning. Uh, then, of course, we work a lot with network operations. Uh, and there is, it's a huge potential because there is so much data. There is uh, one customer can generate one terabyte data per, per day. Right. And, of course, there are so many tickets and alarms out there in the system and there is so much knowledge in the system as well. Yes. In the, in the heads of our experts and that we digitalize, we put it in our, into our system and then we kind of reuse it in many different parts. Mm -hmm. So it's very knowledge intensive, it's very data intensive and that's very uh, exciting for a researcher to work with all this data because... No, oh, I can imagine. We can, it's a dream we can come true. Yes, exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I know people that would work for free just to get access to some of that to do the, this the research. Um, now, there's a number of parts of Ericsson, <coughs> excuse me, like... Uh, You've had Neil Lilly's assurance team who've been applying machine learning to various things around the business support systems. You've had the acquisition of Senex, yeah. now bringing machine learning into the assurance of the operational component and the network. Yeah. Uh, and, and sort of, you know, they talk about the closed loop component of, of that piece of the world. Um, whereabouts do you fit into that whole space in the organization? I mean, it sounds like you're working with almost every part of the organization to bring that capability in. Yeah. How do you glue all those pieces together? Uh, yeah, there, it's actually, um, that's true, we are in every part of the organization yeah. and, the, and we glue them together through uh, the fact that we are actually centralized one or we are logically centralized yeah. one team, yeah. we are a distributed team but logically it's centralized team, we are always talking together. So the research team of 100 people, we know everything, every part of Ericsson that we are right. working with. Then, of course, we have our another organization called, called Global AI Accelerator yep. that's scaling it up. Uh, and they are about 300 people. They will uh, wow. grow. So, um, and then, of course, that's a people dimension. Then, of course, there is a platform dimension to it. We are building platforms in such a way so that we are logically putting all the data streams and the tooling in the same place. Right. So for the data streams, we have um, what we call data pipeline, mm -hmm. uh, where we have the stream data, the bulk data, and also the knowledge, the digitalized knowledge that we have in many different databases and even yep. in, the, in the heads of our experts, we put it all together. Uh, and then we, close to that, we put all the tooling. So the data models, the machine learning models, the, the graph processing systems, mm -hmm. 
they're also there. Right. And then we can reuse it in a different way. So logically centralized, but in practice it's distributed. There must be a lot of challenges in that you've got a lot of uh, network traffic on hold that you're, you're moving backwards and just monitoring from a performance and operational point of view. You're logging various stuff around yeah. uh, billing and, and, and other service assurance and capabilities, uh, different types of billing data and so forth. You must have some massive data lakes that you're having to manage and yeah. imagine truckloads of Hadoop and, and Spark and whatnot. Um, is it the case that you're moving towards a slightly more distributed version of that, that data lake model? Because I imagine you've got, uh, well, firstly, there's just probably petabytes and petabytes of stuff and just your own internal yeah, stuff, right. and then you've got client data that you're delivering services yeah, to. Yeah. I read in the recent mobility report uh, that you're onboarding something like one million new subscribers on the network per day. Mm -hmm. And that's not churn of existing subscribers with handsets coming to other networks, it's new people getting new handsets. Yeah. That's a lot of people activating a lot of new services on multiple devices. And that's before we go to IoT and exactly. massive IoT, critical IoT, broadband IoT, yeah. et cetera. I mean, give us some insight into how you approach those scale problems, because you must be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the top two or three in the world who are dealing with that outside some yeah, of the, yeah. you know, some of the, some of the uh, unicorns of the Facebooks and, and Google. Uh, I don't think a lot of people understand the volume of data that's moving through with its voice calls and Netflix mm -hmm. and IoT. How do you approach yeah. that from a design point of view, operationally? I'd love to get some insights on what your day-to-day -day challenge it's is a, like. It's a great question because I, I think uh, it's, that's so exciting with the telecom networks. They are distributed by nature yeah. and they have compute and they have the links and it's very distributed. And of course we cannot uh, transfer this huge amount of data always, so mm. we can mm. move the, uh, actually the execution, the network functions. Yeah across the network and then for that we are using the machine learning and reasoning so for example when we need to provision a service say for example it's a smart factory and then there are different requirements on the robots and on the conveyor belts and yeah. all the streaming all the video and then we can allocate the slices the, the network slices in a different way right and then through during runtime we can monitor the system so okay. if anything if we pre predict that anything yeah. can, needs to be adjusted then we can just move the virtual network, network functions uh, into different resources. Right. So in the topology, and that's a very distributed system, of course. I guess this is a big plus in that uh, I've been talking about this for a while, but I believe that Ericsson effectively were their own first customer when they started to work on the OpenStack platform, make some serious commitment uh, changes to, and enhancements to uh, both, I guess, you know, everything from Nova through to some of the storage compa mm -hmm. components, so standing up virtual environments, uh, making all of their tools, uh, OSS, BSS, et cetera, uh, cloud native, so, you know, sure. uh, Dockerized, yeah, uh, running under Kubernetes, um, on the OpenStack platform and distributed. Um, and as you said, you can't move all that data around. I remember when the uh, uh, Boeing brought out the 787 Dreamliner and they, they talked about it creating, I think it was like half a terabyte of data per flight. Exactly. And I did some math, right? It was like 87,400 flights just domestically in the US alone, mm. half a terabyte. That's 43 petabytes a day. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, that's probably more disk space that's made in three years. Yeah. Uh, so we had to look at how do we move the intelligence to the engine network, get it closer to the airplane. Yeah. Yeah. When we think about the telco networks, that's at a whole new level. There's like yeah. a lot of extra zeros on it. So how do you how do you see the uh, shift from sort of centralized uh, storage and compute and analysis moving to the edge of the network? Because we hear a lot about this edge compute, mm -hmm. edge networking, edge routing. Yeah. Uh, do you see that you can you'll be able to package that capability up and distribute that all mm -hmm. out to the edge? Because I think there's a couple of challenges there. You've got people who want it on premise for various reasons that are, um, you know whether they're a telco or an enterprise. You've got uh, nations that want the data remote be local in Australia. We've got a privacy act where you yeah, can't yeah. move federal data offshore. Sure. You've got GDPR. Yeah. Uh, the US uh, have their own rules, etc. Um, Swiss have their own rules. Uh, is it the case you're now having to take that big challenge of doing data analysis and look at it in a much more distributed fashion with all these different tiers of mm. service assurance, compliance, governance? Yeah. That that's that must be a heady challenge. So so I think it's a very exciting challenge because it's so complex and it, mm. uh, mm. once again. Uh, it, as a researcher, I enjoy it a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we work quite a lot with federated learning yep. uh, and transfer learning. So federated learning, it means that we never need to move the data. We, mm -hmm. we learn the models and then we just uh, uh, kind of collect many different models yeah. logically, centrally, and then we find the average or the best model that we distribute back to the nodes and then they can be improved. Yeah, so yeah. it's uh, kind of uh, all together they get improved. But that, of course, requires very uh, good privacy frameworks. Absolutely. So that we cannot correlate the pieces of data because the models come, may come from different customers mm -hmm. and we are very careful with the privacy there. Well, I imagine there's an intellectual property challenge as well because if, uh, if I'm a telco in Australia, you've built 
that capability and modeling for what we're doing, yeah. we may or may not want our competitors to get that. At the same time, there are some things in the com common component of the network where we do want the shared advantage. And I think we saw this with the uh, OSS BSS uh, user group in New York where they were like, I think you got 61 telcos under the same roof mm -hmm. uh, and nobody was trying to kill each other. They were talking about collaboration and co-creation yeah. and co-competing. Yeah. Um, and uh, the topic of AI came up and we were talking about where is the line going to be drawn between where the data moves in and out and where the intellectual property moves in and out for building models, building analytics. Where do you draw the line from regression starting and finishing and whose data is what? Um, so one of the things I'm really keen to, to learn about is um, AI has been on the lips of a lot of people for a long time. We've had a lot of hype about it. Yeah. And there's a, a divergence between sort of you know machine learning per se versus the more sentient focused deep learning. Mm -hmm. um, maybe give us a, a bit of a clarification around the type of machine learning you're applying and why you think artificial intelligence and leveraging machine learning and data science become such a hot topic in the telco space. Mm -hmm. Of course. Uh, so we actually use many different types of machine learning. We use uh, both uh, supervised and uh, supervised learning, and then we use deep, deep learning as well, mm -hmm. reinforcement learning. Uh, important thing is that uh, it, it depends on the use case, of right. course. And this is one part of AI for me. The other part is machine reasoning, where we work more with structures. And right. this machine learning and machine reasoning, they need to work together all the time. So whenever we learn something, uh, we can predict something, we put, we create knowledge objects out of learning and then we put it in the, into mm -hmm. our knowledge base, we update that all the time. So, uh, and then it, it turned out to be very helpful for us when, right. we, we, for example, um, in our project that uh, resulted in our uh, Ericsson operations engine that was launched here this week. Um, uh, and we can predict a lot of... Uh, yeah. yeah. And congratulations on that, by the way. Thank a you so much. A huge launch. Yes. Um, no, I think I heard something about the, um, there was a project somewhere, it was Middle East or somewhere where um, some of this was applied to a particular carriage network and they found about 2% of their infrastructure were sleeping cells. Yeah. And they were able to then recover that and resolve the problem and, and get them making money again. I mean, that's a non-trivial percentage of the network that's technically asleep yeah. that hadn't been detected, that machine learning and artificial intelligence had discovered, reported on and alerted on and then, you know, break yeah. fix type intelligence. Exactly. And I imagine when you scale that on a global level, it becomes billions and billions and billions yeah. of dollars. And the best thing in this case, we can also, also um, trigger the automation uh, right. without a human need, yep. need to go to go on site and repair it because it can be... That is remote. exciting. Yeah, exactly. And we've seen that on the internet. I mean, Border Gateway Protocol keeps the internet running. I mean, when the internet was originally created, the concept was that it would route around a nuclear explosion, right? Yeah. So I think we, we're used to that happening, but people don't quite know where the intelligence line draws with machine learning. Um, where do you see the, the greatest excitement in the market? Who's, who's jumping at this first? What, are there particular industry groups who get it and see the value you want to jump at it? Or is it, are all industries getting it and just coming as early as they can? Where are the hot spots? Who's, who's adopting first? I think, uh, I think all, all uh, knowledge and data intensive companies are winning a lot. Yep. I think when we started uh, some 10 years ago, we felt wherever there is data, we have to apply the algorithms. Right, right. Because there is so much to win. I yep. think it's so exciting. I think telecom is a very exciting area, but I mean, of course, there are other industries that are kind of heavy on this uh, domain domain knowledge. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's uh, it's exciting for an AI researcher to put it in a context, and then oh, you absolutely. see a huge wins, of course, in that. Yeah, yeah. There's a big difference between playing on a whiteboard and doing an algorithm yeah. versus actually applying data and seeing real results. Yes. So Mobile World Congress is an exciting event, and there's a lot of really cool flashing lights and new demos, and magic happens to make them work. Yeah. Um, but it, it seems to me that you know once the event's over, the really heavy lifting happens after that. So where do we, as the last question, if you don't mind, where do we go next? What happens after Mobile World Congress from your point of view? Well, from my point of view, we need to accelerate. Uh, we need to accelerate the research and innovation in this space, right. of course, even further. So it's still be flashy, I yep. think. Uh, if we show, for example, different uh, use cases on uh, augmented uh, and virtual reality with, uh, for example, uh, goggles, mm -hmm. uh, then I would like to see it absolutely aut aut automatic with the uh, use of drones and uh, okay. robotics. That would be very exciting. Then, of course, new features. We need to have new features in our operations. We need to have new features, many new features in the next mm -hmm. generation of uh, 5G system. Uh, so there will be a lot of exciting work ahead. Yeah, it's a very bright future. Well, thank you so much for making time to catch up with me. It's an absolute thank pleasure you. to see you. Thank you. I cannot wait to see what comes out of your team working on the AI research part of uh, Ericsson over the next 12 to 18 months. And uh, yeah, I think the future is bright for all of us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it.